Welcome back everybody, I'm Professor G and what we're going to talk about now is the book of Exodus. Um, now if you want to go ahead and pull up, pull up your reading, um, I'm going to work our way through the first couple of chapters and I just really give you some context for what exactly is happening here and why it's happening. Now, uh, the book of Exodus is, most of you are probably familiar with the Bible. Right, the, the Bible as a whole. Okay, uh, now the Hebrew Bible is what most people refer to as the Old Testament. But throughout this lecture, throughout this class, uh, I'll refer to it as the Hebrew Bible because Old Testament is a bit derogative for Jewish people. So Hebrew Bible. Now the Hebrew Bible is composed of several different sections. Okay, uh, and within the United States, since most people are Christian, and when Christians think about the Bible, they kind of uh, think about the Bible as a whole, okay, that the Bible's the Word of God, that it tells us about God, so on and so forth. Um, and we don't really think of one part of the Bible being better than or somehow more special than another part of the Bible, right? Um, Within the Hebrew Bible, though, we have different sections. And the first five books of the Hebrew Bible are referred to as the Torah. And the Torah is what is given to Moses at Mount Sinai, traditionally speaking. This is what Jewish people believe, the Jewish tradition teaches. Um, Moses, as you'll read in the first couple chapters of Exodus, uh, is the chosen one of God who will lead his people out of slavery, who will lead his people out of Egypt, out of bondage, bring his people to Mount Sinai where his people will be brought into a contract, a covenant with God. God will give his people the law. And so the Torah consists of this story. Okay, The Torah includes Genesis uh, Genesis being the story of creation, Adam and Eve, uh, Noah, the Tower of Babel, you've probably heard this before. Uh, Exodus is really the story of Moses and really the story of Sinai. Um, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, those last three books are books of the law. It's the instructions, the directions that God gave the people at Sinai. So, you're reading the first couple chapters of Exodus and the Jewish people are in Egypt. How did they get there? And why are they there? Okay. To answer that question, we have to go back to Genesis. Remember, Genesis is the origin story, not just the origin of the earth, but also the origin of the Jewish people, where they trace their roots back to. So perhaps the most important person or thing in Genesis is not creation, but is Abraham. Now, why would I say that Abraham's the most important? Because Abraham is the father of the Jewish nation. Remember, Abraham is called by God. He's living in what was perhaps modern-day Mesopotamia, modern-day Iraq, Iran. And so he's called by God. And God tells Abraham, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. And he's going to make of Abraham a great nation. So he calls Abraham. Abraham leaves his home. He brings his family and his servants and uh, perhaps the animals that he was herding. He brings them all out of their home, out of their comfort zone, and takes them into a new place. And God tells Abraham, you will have a child. Now this is problematic because as the story goes, Abraham is an elderly man. He's up there in age and his wife Sarah is past the age of childbearing. So Sarah comes up with an idea. Hey, Abraham, I'm not going to be able to have your kid, but take my servant, Hagar. And so this uh, young, uh, beautiful, Middle Eastern woman, right, with long black hair, tan skin comes in, and Abraham says, well, okay, right, he's not going to refuse that. Um, sorry, this is getting to my own interpretation of the Bible, reading a bit too much into it, maybe. Okay, so Abraham and Hagar have a child. That child's name is Ishmael. Ishmael, you may have heard of that name before. But then God says, that's not quite what I meant. I want you to have a child with Sarah. So Abraham does, and it's a miracle, and the child's name is Isaac. 
Now eventually Sarah gets jealous because Isaac and she sees Isaac and Ishmael playing together. Um, she doesn't like it, so she tells Abraham to ban them. Abraham bans Hagar and Ishmael. They're sent off into the wilderness. Uh, they almost starve to death. Uh, Hagar is distraught, so she has to leave Ishmael behind because she doesn't want to see her baby starve to death. And the angel of the Lord comes to them and uh, rescues them, gives them a proclamation. Anyway, so Abraham and Isaac, of course you've probably heard of the story of the binding of Isaac, Abraham having to sacrifice Isaac, and at the last minute God intervenes and is like, oh no, oh, just kidding, JK, LOL, just, that, that was just a prank, right? Just a prank, bro. Um, and so Isaac's not really killed, and there's this whole dilemma of faith and uh, testing the faith and all this other stuff. Anyway, so Isaac has two sons of his own. Uh, Jacob and Esau. Uh, Esau is his firstborn son, but not by very much because the Bible tells us that when Esau is born, Jacob comes out grabbing his heel. And Jacob is a very odd biblical character. Not typically the person, people when people think of the Bible, think of like saintly people and whatnot. Uh, Jacob, not so much. Jacob's a, a, a swindler. He's a bit of a con man. Does a lot of very underhanded stuff. And him and Esau are constantly uh, going at it as brothers. I mean, they're, they're constantly bumping heads. Anyway, uh, Jacob manages to steal Esau's birthright. His dying father, who is on his deathbed, uh, he's blind because he's so old, and he calls he calls his son in there to give him the birthright, and Jacob tricks his dying blind father into giving him the birthright. And so Jacob, uh, which is, you know, again, speaks to Jacob's character. So Jacob gets the birthright. Now, Jacob has 12 children, 12 boys, which would later become the foundation for the 12 tribes of Israel. And of these 12, the youngest is Joseph. Now, brothers in the Bible tend not to treat each other too well, but I think Joseph's brothers take the cake. Right? They didn't really like Joseph because uh, he believed he'd had all these dreams and he believed that he was special, right? That he was somehow had like a unique insight into the world. And so I think Joseph's brothers respond like any brothers would do. Uh, they beat him till an inch of a life into the inch of his life, dig this big trench and throw him into it, and then sell him into slavery. And Joseph is sold into slavery, and eventually he winds up in, guess where? Egypt. So this is where Exodus picks up at. And I've currently lost my place because I dropped the Bible. Oh, anyway, here, here we go. So the Jewish people are in Egypt. They're doing well uh, because Joseph, uh, he does this interpretation of the dream thing with the Pharaoh, and they enjoy a prominent place within Egyptian society. But Exodus opens up, and we have a problem. The problem is, chapter 1, verse 8, Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. This new Pharaoh sees the people, and he says, Wait a minute, what are all these Jewish people getting here, doing here? Right? taking up all of our land, eating all of our food. What if somebody came and invaded and the Jewish people sided with them? They outnumber us. we got to do something about this. And so he enslaves them. He, it says, verse 11, chapter 1, Therefore they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. So, by the beginning of chapter 2, we have the enslavement of the Jewish people at the hands of the Egyptians. And now we have the birth of of Moses. So, a few of the Egyptian uh, midwives, the, the ladies who deliver the babies, uh, they save Moses. They save Moses, and Moses' mother decides that uh, she is going to put her child in a basket, set him in the river, um, and hope that somebody picks him up. And in fact, somebody does, Pharaoh's daughter. Pharaoh's daughter picks Moses up, Moses' sister, who was looking out to make sure the baby's okay, comes to her and says, Oh, that's a great baby. Let me go get you a wet nurse. And she brings Moses' mother to nurse him. Anyway, Moses grows up within the court of Pharaoh. By the end of chapter 2, though, something else happens. What happens? Moses sees how his people are being treated. He sees an Egyptian that is beating a slave, decides to take out his anger on that slave, kills the guy. Right? And then he breaks up a fight, 
and the other guys are like, well, are you going to kill us too? We saw you kill that other guy. Moses has to flee. Now, we pick up our story in chapter 3. Uh, this gets to the interesting stuff. So Moses flees, he gets a wife, he has a kid, and one day he's out herding his flock. And he's walking around, and all of a sudden he sees this burning bush that is not consumed by the fire. And out of this bush he hears, chapter 3, verse 4, Moses, Moses. And Moses says, here I am, right? Uh, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, all those people we just talked about. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid. And then God tells Moses, I have chosen you to deliver your people from bondage, from Egypt. You will be my chosen one. And Moses says to God, uh, okay, that's all well and good, but um, who exactly am I talking to again? What's your name? And God responds, I am who I am. Right? Probably one of the strangest proclamations in Scripture. So, what does this story mean? So, what I want you to do is I want you to look at it and examine it uh, within the context of Egyptian religion. Compare and contrast, right? How is the God of Exodus different from the Egyptian gods? Is he different? Uh, do you notice any similarities there? Similarities versus differences. And kind of focus on how God and Moses interact. Also focus on the story of Moses. Focus on the context. Focus on what's happening. Is there something different about this God? Alright guys, uh, that's it for today. If you have any questions, feel free to email me.